My name is Rebecca Slayton. I'm the director of the Re uh, Repi Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome today our speaker, Dr. Stephen Johnson. He is a Kanaka uh, Maoli uh, Native Hawaiian scientist born and raised in Micronesia. Currently, he's an assistant professor in natural resources and the environment at Cornell University. His research questions are informed by his heritage and upbringing, focusing on the impacts of climate change, colonialism, and conservation on coastal communities, uh, primarily in the Pacific Islands. He uses social, environmental, and climate data to develop equitable and cooperative solutions for coastal communities. This work is a direct practice of his responsibility to use his knowledge and skills to improve the social and environmental spaces that he's a part of. And so we're really looking forward to uh, learning more about your research. Thank you, Rebecca. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. We're going to start off with some form of a positionality statement. Um, I think it's important for all of you, aside from the uh, kind of canned introduction, I, I, <laughs> I hand off to people to really know who I am. I think that's pretty instrumental to um, not just the type of work that I do, but I think all the work we do, right? Um, I was just lecturing in a class this morning about uh, what the Enlightenment had done for our understanding of our place in, in nature, and right, uh, it removed us from there. We became this disembodied, distant, distanced observer of, of this thing we happen to be in, which seems kind of crazy that you would be able to convince yourself of that. And so I'm going to convince you that I am a part of this very much, and I'm very proud to be a part of this. So um, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm uh, Native Hawaiian, but that's this kind of the simple thing. I'm multicultural, like a lot of us, um, and I'm a Pacific Islander, and my family comes from a bunch of different Pacific Islands. Primarily Hawaii, they all kind of found their way there, but also I have some Rarotongan ancestry from the Cook Islands. Uh, on my maternal side of the family, Afro-Caribbean uh, from Jamaica, and my grandfather was uh, Jewish uh, from Eastern Europe. And um, I was born in Micronesia, so I kind of cover all over the place, right? Uh, so in, in some ways, I'm exactly of the place I'm studying and talking about, but in other ways, I'm completely removed of it, right? So I think it just kind of pops the bubble of the fallacy that we are separate from the things we observe, or we are completely embedded within it. I think that's an important uh, lesson that doesn't have anything to do with the content. Um, yeah, so I was born in Micronesia. Uh, we'll, we'll talk quite a bit about that. But I want to start by sharing these two pictures up here. Um, these two pictures up at the top, the one on the left is a painting by a native Hawaiian artist, uh, Herb Kane. And he had a dream, because uh, now we might, it might be well known that uh, Pacific Islanders uh, use uh, celestial navigation to traverse the Pacific Ocean. But for a long time, people thought that was a myth. It was a joke. They thought they just drifted. The wind pushed them there. They happened to find themselves there. Um, but our stories and our genealogy tell us that wasn't the case. And he had a dream, and he painted this photo um, of a boat that Hawaiians would once again sail the seas using our traditional methods. And we've done that. Um, the other picture is another boat that has an important connection to my ancestry. And I think many of us are familiar with that schematic. Right? That's, that's a slave ship, right? And so I've just, in the very recent past, kind of stumbled upon uh, the power that these two boats give me and, and, and my responsibility coming from descendants of those two boats to tell a really compelling, humane story about the world we live in, right? So I come from a line of uh, explorers, intrepidering souls willing to to travel the Pacific Ocean, but I also come from people who've been subjugated and been told like they have to cross the ocean against their own will. So the ocean is this really amazing, beautiful, complex space where we do a lot of things. And we're going to talk about some of those things like fishing, um, but they play out in some interesting ways. So uh, in specific, I'm going to talk about my thoughts on climate change, fisheries conflict, um, and food security, and kind of how conservation plays a mediating role there. Right, so outline of our talk, I think so is important. Uh, we're going to start off with who and what are the Pacific Islands? This is a brief lesson in geography and history. Um, this is a photo of the bay I didn't grow up too far from, pretty picturesque. <laughs> but here, this is the Pacific Islands, right? This is maybe the oldest map of the Pacific Islands, but it doesn't look like anything that most of us are kind of comfortable 
with, right? But this is a navigation chart a from the Marshall Islands in Micronesia, right? So these shells here represent where the islands are, and then the sticks are intersecting uh, kind of star paths and wind currents, right? But this is true. This is what the Pacific, I this is how Pacific Islanders viewed the Pacific, right? So it's, it's beautiful. Um, it, it tells you everything you need to know about how um, it's not a big, empty, blue space, but it's highly connected in very intricate ways. But maybe this is a little bit more comfortable for us, right? This is uh, orthographic projection of Oceania, one of the names we have for the region. And a couple things to note is big, right? You could take all the land mass of Earth and throw it inside the Pacific Ocean, and there's still more space. Fascinating. Um, but not only is it big and immense, but there's a lot of little places on there, right? On uh, on my personal web page, I have a little Google map thing that's in my about me section. And there's a little red pin drop that's in the middle of the ocean. And at that scale, you can't tell that there's anything there, but there's a lot there. Um, and so I want to bring us into a kind of a framing conceptually with this quote by um, Pacific Islander scholar Eli Haofa. Says 19th century imperialism erected boundaries that led to the contraction of Oceania, transforming a once boundless world into the Pacific island states and territories we know today. Right? So we had that big, immense open space, and now it's it's not so big. We, we don't even call them that, right? We call them small island developing states, despite that they take up you know most of the planet. <laughs> um, so a little bit about the Pacific Islands or Oceania is another word we might use for them. Um, is that they're highly culturally and geographically diverse spaces, right? We have, um, we have different groups like Polynesians, Melanesians, Micronesians. We have um, free independent nations. We have colonies, right? So we have all these different uh, socioeconomic and political structures. We have some places in Oceania like Australia and New Zealand that are, right, as good as you could get in today's modern society, but then we also have some places that are really, really struggling. Um, you know, places like the Solomon Islands or even areas in Papua New Guinea where there's lots of violence that's going on in these places. And there's a lot of people too, 44 million people across these islands and territories. And these are the beautiful flags that they re represent these people. So here's another representation of the Pacific. Right now we're getting Maybe even more comfortable, right? The, the last one was just like the globe and we couldn't really tell whose territory was what, right? But now we have these, uh, these boundaries that we've drawn around a bunch of the islands. Uh, a lot of these boundaries were only really erected um, in the early 1980s, um, but we've now divided up into places like Palau, the Solomons, Kiribati, French Polynesia. And then we can even do some other like tricky cultural, like academic -y stuff is throw on these other groups that mean something and nothing all at the same time, right? We can call some of these islands Micronesian. We can call some of them Polynesian. We can call some of them Melanesian. And they're all kind of the result of a colonial construct, right? Is that we have islands in the Federated States of Micronesia where linguistically they're more closely related uh, to people from the Cook Islands. But we would still call them Micronesia because their island is small. And that's what's important, right? Is what the islands look like, not what the people are doing on those places. So this is just a fun little exercise I like to walk people through to get comfortable with how big and dynamic um, a space um, we'll be talking about is. And it's not just a place with cool cultures and beautiful landscapes, but it's also got immense geopolitical relevance and a super important area for fisheries. Right, so just some headlines over the last uh, year or so about the Pacific, right? Uh, the U.S. is enhancing the U.S. Pacific Island Partnership. Uh, Micronesia, the next U.S.-China battleground. Uh, in a new battle for the Pacific, U.S. and China force regional states to take sides, right? Who's team China? Who's team U.S.? Um, and a lot of it is because they take up so much real estate, right? Despite that name of small island developing state, they take up so much space that the two biggest economies in the world are fighting over. Will you be my friend? Will you be my friend? We're gonna- At the end? At the end, yeah. Um, right, so there's this, this tug of war over, over the uh, political allegiances of um, 
these, these islands. Uh, but then they also are super important for feeding the world. Um, does anyone in here eat tuna? Yeah. Has anyone ever eaten tuna, right? You can't, especially canned tuna. Well, right? just tuna. canned tuna. Right? <laughs> tuna right? And it's funny that we call it tuna fish, right? We don't, we don't say like hamburger cow or like <laughs> chicken chicken, right? But tuna fish is what I guess we, we call it. But one in four uh, tuna that go into the cans comes from uh, the Pacific Islands. And in fact, it comes from the waters of eight of these countries that we've been talking about. Um, and more than just the tuna, but those fish are managed by the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. So it's an intergovernmental body that manages uh, access to those resources. And importantly, there's this thing called the Parties to the Nauru Agreement, which set up a pretty innovative system for managing um, the fishery. It's it can be a contentious thing to say that it's a well-managed fishery. Some people say that's not even a possible thing. Um, but as far as fisheries go, this one seems to be doing pretty good in terms of its uh, ecological sustainability, but also in its payout for um, you know, the host country, right? Um, and so this agreement uh, came about to limit and monitor how much time boats spend fishing in the, the region. Okay, now we're going to zoom in into an even more um, kind of interesting subset of the Pacific Islands. We're going to talk about the U.S. affiliated Pacific. Um, I guess how many people in here knew that the U.S. had Pacific Islands outside of Hawaii? All right, well, that's good, that's good. All right, and if you knew it was Guam, put your hand up. If you, can, if you knew there was one other than Guam or Hawaii, all right, other than American Samoa, <laughs> all right, all right, okay, we're going. And then, so then there's my home, uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And as a kid, it was always, where are you from? I'm from Saipan. Where's Saipan? It's in the Sina Mai. Where's that? It's near Guam. Where's Guam? It's near Hawaii. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but in, in reality, you could, you could fit the entire unit between Guam and uh, Hawaii. So I was lying when I said, oh, it's near Hawaii. <laughs> right. Uh, but so the U.S. takes up a lot of real estate in the Pacific Ocean, right? We basically, from California to Hawaii, there's nothing. So you're basically going from U.S., and then the next kind of sovereign piece of ocean is U.S. And then you go from Hawaii out to my neck of the woods. And again, there's it's high seas, but then it's the U.S. again, right? So the U.S. has a lot at stake when it comes to the uh, Pacific Islands. But then how did we get to this uh, situation here? Well, uh, the U.S. Um, was involved in a lot of imperialism over, <laughs> over the years, right? With the uh, Spanish-American War, uh, the U.S. Um, in control of Guam, the Philippines, and American Samoa, in addition to Cuba and uh, Puerto Rico. Um, and then post-World War II, we had a huge reshuffling of uh, kind of the geopolitical order as you would have it. Um, you know, a lot of the Pacific was either in not colonized or they were colonized by the Japanese. And after World War II, Japan um, had to kind of give up its terror, its possessions. Um, we're going to use some of that language. And uh, the Micronesia region was put on a development pathway. Um, this development <laughs> pathway was initiated by the Trust Territories um, program through the United Nations, right? And so um, Places like Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, prior to get, getting those names, were given kind of an option of choose your, choose your own adventure. How do you want to go about this, this big new world? Um, there were limits to that, right? They weren't necessarily given full resources to restart their economies. But um, what, to make a long story short, is a lot of these countries ended up being closely affiliated with the United States, right? So. Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, Republic of Marshall Islands all have compacts of free association with the United States, which is a really important um, legal arrangement where um, citizens of these countries uh, can travel into the U.S. and work in the U.S. visa-free. Um, they can also access some public services as well. Um, and in return, they let the U.S. kind of use their uh, ocean and land resources for economic and military opportunity, right? So, um, so now it's not just the kind of green spots that the U.S. has access to, but it's all those other uh, exclusive economic zones or regions that the U.S. has 
uh, access to, right? So this is why China and the US are fighting is because that's a lot of real estate. Those tuna are worth a lot of money. And so this is kind of where the action is, I think, in uh, fisheries and geopolitics. All right, so now kind of now that we know where we are and what we're, we're talking about, we're gonna quickly go through some climate outlook stuff. Um, quickly, we're talking about the climate change pathway because we tend to think of climate as just being this, the impacts, right? That like, oh, ice caps are melting, sea levels are rising, storms are getting stronger. But really, this is, this is what climate change is. It kind of starts from an economic, a policy decision of how we're gonna interact with the world, right? It's not just the end. It starts back here, right? It starts on what is your economy based off of? And then that economy might lead to some emissions, right? We have we we often use resources. Even very rural uh, uh, groups will be burning wood to keep warm, to cook, heat water. So it's not that there's only one way to generate emissions, but so we have economy emissions. Those emissions can concentrate in the atmosphere. That can start to change the climate, and those climate that change in climate results in some impacts. So we can kind of enter these different windows along this pathway if we want to solve the problem. Right. We could decarbonize our economy as one solution to this climate change problem. We could suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We could geoengineer if, if we don't want to kind of pull down the emissions. We can just kind of mess with it that way. Or and where the space I tend to interact with, and I think most of us do, is the adaptation side, right? Is like, oh, the climate's changing, these impacts are resulting. So how are we gonna uh, keep moving forward with that? In the Pacific Islands, these are kind of the general expectations for indicators, um, changes in extreme events, rainfall patterns changing, increased ocean heat content, increased sea level rise around some parts of the Pacific, um, well, uh, drought is gonna be more likely. So these are some of the um, indicators we'd be looking at. Some of the impacts directly from those indicators would be water supply issues, coastal erosion, loss of habitat and rare species, which is one thing we'll be talking about a bit more. Fisheries and ocean biodiversity loss, for sure. And uh, coral reef fishing loss, amongst a number of other things. All right, and so the obvious climate impacts in this region are stronger storms, increased frequency of coral bleaching, uh, accelerated rates of sea level rise. But note that all of this is physical impacts, right? Uh, haven't really talked too much about the direct human impacts um, of climate change. Um, but we're going to focus on one impact, um, which is tied to people, which is fish, right? People eat fish, kind of an important thing to say. Um, but fish are not just kind of brainless, living around, getting cooked in the ocean. They move, right? They, they cover a lot of distance. And a lot of research is showing that fish are moving in response to climate change, right? They're living in a place that's happy with them, and they live in this... A uh, pretty boundless, borderless thing called the ocean. And so they can kind of follow that place to keep up with uh, what's good for them uh, metabolically. Um, but importantly, fish have never cared about national jurisdictions, right? They, the, the, the Convention of the Law of the Sea was passed and nothing changed for fish, really. They just kept going. There's that great map where they've like inverted the land and the ocean, and it's like, this is the world of the fish. <laughs> um, maybe I should throw that map up next time. Um, but what we're finding here is that over time, fish are moving, and so they're crossing these jurisdictional boundaries. It doesn't matter to them, I think, that decision-making process, but it matters to us, right? Because we've based a lot of policy, we've uh, built a lot of different intergovernmental organizations around where we know the fish to be, right? The Western Central Pacific Fishing Commission, the parties of the Nauru Agreement, it's all based around the idea that we know where the fish are and we can manage them accordingly. And so, uh, let's see. We don't need this one and I'd rather us get to, to, to questions. Oh, no. Here. And sorry, uh, potential conflict drivers is what we want to be thinking about, right? Is that as we have these effects, particularly of fish changing where they are, how fast they grow, that's going to lead to potential conflict drivers. And those are things like legal uncertainty, right? It's like, well, we have this agreement of how these eight countries are going to manage 
um, the, the tuna stock because that's where they spend 80% of their time. So it makes sense that they would have this outsized management decision-making power. But what happens when now that time spent in those eight countries, uh, EEZs is gone, right? What happens when they spend most of their time in the high seas, which some people like to say is lawless, but it's actually the commons, right? It's a place we all have a stake in, but it's very difficult to, do, to, to manage the commons. So what are we gonna do when uh, fish change locations, uh, changing fisher socioeconomics as a knock-on, right? Uh, it's a huge um, employment sector in the Pacific Islands fisheries. So what happens when people can't fish as much? Or the, the you know economic and climate justice implications of those types of things. All right, so now we're going to kind of move into the meat of the presentation, which is the macro and micro consequences of uh, these shifting uh, fish distributions due to climate change. So, future fish forest. I argued tooth and nail against this uh, title, but uh, the PI and project, who was my PhD advisor, he. He loved it, and so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have as much sway in them, so I thought it was a little, uh, thought we could have been a little bit more poetic. Future fish wars, here we are. <laughs> All right, so future fish wars, chasing ocean ecosystem wealth, mouthful, but find me a, a grant proposal that isn't a mouthful. Um, so what we're doing here is, um, first, first of all, it's a, a very interdisciplinary and collaborative project. There's myself um, here at Cornell. I'll have a grad student coming onto the project next year. But then we have a team um, over at Oregon State University, uh, some folks at University of Exeter, Peterson Institute for International Economics, uh, and partners at uh, the World Wildlife Foundation. And this work was funded by the Minerva Research Initiative. And so this is the Department of Defense's social science research program. Um, and so you've heard of, kind of like DARPA type stuff, which is like the, the gizmos and gadgets, the bleeps and bloops. And these are like the people. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's how I like to kind of differentiate. Uh, but yeah, across those institutions, we have a bunch of different um, expertise as well, which I think is what kind of brings a lot of um, excitement into this project is we've got oceanographers, fishery scientists, economists, folks in international relations, and then I'm a uh, conservation social scientist. Um, and so our conversations, a lot of us are lost a lot, a lot of the time is, is, a, is a good way to, to say it. But you're, if you're not lost a lot of the time, you're not really doing uh, interdisciplinary work. <laughs> All right, so our project has three main overarching goals. The first one is to develop some new economic tools for assessing economic value of fisheries under climate change. I'll briefly touch on that. Um, we're also constructing a database of fishery conflict events, and we're advancing theory on conflict and cooperation in fisheries and climate change. Um, I'll be touching on this one the least because it depends on the other two, and we're just in the uh, starting phases of this project. So first we're going to talk about fisheries conflict, and we got to define the word we're using, right? So fisheries conflict has been defined as an incident in which a fisheries resource is either one of the following, contested, disputed, or the source of conflict between a minimum of two actors at a discrete time and a discrete place, right? And so this was a kind of a big deal article in the New York Times Magazine. It's like their cover story, I think. Uh, it was Palau versus the poachers, right? And so this was documenting a series of events of um, poachers coming over from uh, Vietnam into Palau's waters. And Palau has a population of just under 20,000 people. And right, Vietnam has, I don't know the number, several million, we'll call it that. And so Palau needs to do something because uh, we've got this really, really, really big economic uh, power like Vietnam, right? Relatively speaking, uh, coming into Palau's sovereign waters, waters and taking their fish. And Palau actually was like, fighting back against them, right? They, they um, got a bunch of their boats, they detained the, the crew on there and it, and it became quite a, a big case. So what we're interested in is understanding, well, we kind of know the general idea of how we get to these conflicts, but we also want to understand, well, we know that fish are a resource and resources have monetary value, but are we properly kind of understanding how we're saying that tuna is worth 
this much money, right? And so what we're trying to propose, and by we I'm talking about the economists on my team, who I am quickly uh, learning a bunch of new words that I'll be throwing out at you uh, today. Um, we're doing something called natural capital asset pricing. Again, another mouthful, but basically what we're trying to do here, and this is something that's happening all over the world and it's happening at a national level. It's actually a um, initiative out of the White House to do a accounting of all of the United States national assets. Um, but it's to figure out, well, how much is a fish stock truly worth? Um, and there's a couple of things that uh, go into that calculation, but what we want to know is, well, we know that these fish don't care about the boundaries, right? And so the value of that fish stock in a time and place changes depending on who has access to it, right? Access is such an important concept across much of the social science fields, right? Like economics and conservation, right? Being able to do something with the resource can completely change its value, right? And not being able to access that resource can make it worthless to you. And so we want to try and account for that. It's like as fish move across um, sovereign and high seas waters, right? How, how are we going to account for for that price. And so there's that value of fish as food, but fish as food for who, right? Is it worth more when it's in all the US affiliated um, Pacific Island territories, right? That we have a better chance of accessing that resource or is it worth even more when it's in the high seas and we don't actually have to go through a mediary to capture that resource, right? So there's some non-intuitive thinking going on there that we're trying to come up with some uh, formulas to account for that. But then we also want to bring into the uh, conversation that there's also the value of the fish when it's still in the water, right? There's a conservation value, um, especially as we know that overfishing has historically been a problem. Climate change is doing all kinds of things to fishes, physiology, reproductive um, uh, strategies, all those things that fishes conservation is also a valuable thing. And so how do we start to, uh, include that into this price of this asset. And then, um, yeah, so we want to look at the, the different networks of, of people or institutions that are accessing or governing the, the resource. And one way we're going to do that is to create like balance sheets. So this is some newer stuff that I've had less time to be as intimate with, but I appreciate you uh, hanging on with me. And so what we're going to look at is the management objective for sustainable oceans. And we're really interested in non-declining ocean wealth. And by we, you mean the United Nations High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, right? So this is a big, big global thing is that changes in ocean wealth are the most important indicator of sustainability. And so we're a part of that conversation and we're hoping that we can balance and really make a more holistic definition of what ocean health and ocean wealth mean, right? That it can't just be the resource in one view of its utility, which is food. It should also be in some of the other ways that we're leading this. So how do we measure ocean wealth? Well, we got to change. We got to look at the delta or the change in the balance sheets of ocean assets. So what are ocean assets, right? So we have capital assets. Those are things that store wealth, enable future consumption through goods and services. And then particularly we have ocean assets. And so they can be capital assets, manufactured, natural, social, um, that exist within the marine and coastal economy. And so within that, we have two different types of assets. We have produced ocean assets. So those are like the boats that we're on, like that's an ocean asset. Oil rigs, port infrastructure, tinned fish as well. Um, but there's also the non-produced ocean assets. And this is kind of the space that we're really interested in is wild caught fish stocks, right? There's the market value, but does that capture the whole, um, the true value of the asset? You know, coral reefs, they've, they've had values assigned to them based on tourism, right? Or how much wave energy they attenuate as a piece of um, infrastructure um, resources. The, the question mark around the prices of of how are we actually valuing um, the um, wild caught fish stocks? So the value of natural capital depends uh, importantly on context, right? We've been talking a lot about location and institutions and how we're uh, accounting for 
wealth in the context of, of those two um, areas. So if we're looking at climate induced wealth transfers might not be um, a net, might not be zero sum, right? So we have two situations we're looking at. Um, one is value asymmetry, and that's where the fish stock has now moved from one location to a, another location. And so now there's like an asymmetrical shift in the value of that, and that's tied to access, right? Nation B could not access the fish when it was very clearly in Nation A's waters, but climate change is now bringing that fish stock to kind of straddle that border. So now the values have shifted asymmetrically uh, towards another actor. We could also have value compression, which is where we might have the same amount of value of fish, but in a smaller area, right? So we're all like chasing that last fish. We're chasing the, the smaller stock or the smaller area where that same amount of fish can um, exist. And so there's kind of two consequences we might think of. One is arbitrage and the other is conflict. And so we're kind of interested in, you know, what is leading to conflict, but also what's leading to cooperation. And to understand that, we're building a fisheries conflict database and we're using some machine learning algorithms to kind of scour the internet for um, newspaper articles, reports, on, um, on fisheries conflict events. Um, surprisingly, we've got the model trained to have a 90% accuracy rate, which is kind of insane. Um, that I, uh, I had a friend who did this for uh, their dissertation and they did not use a machine learning algorithm. And we reproduced their dissertation in six months. So machines are, are coming for some of the work we do, but not all of it, right? The machines are going to ask the really cool, interesting questions, but the machines will definitely make our, our work somewhat easier or quicker in some respects. And so for our conflict database, we're focusing on three case study regions, the Western and Central Pacific, which is the one that I'll be leading and I'll be talking about mostly today. But we also have interest in doing work in the Arctic Ocean and the South China Sea. Um, this table here is looking at kind of hotspots for potential fisheries conflict based off of different climate change scenarios. And what you'll notice is Pacific islands tend to always dominate uh, where they expect there to be the most fisheries conflict. All right, so Kiribati um, is right in the central Pacific and it's the number one spot for predicted fisheries conflict. And then Federated States of Micronesia also uh, pops up um, in different climate scenarios. And so this, this uh, database will allow us to kind of create a network um, looking at who are the actors, when and where are they interacting, um, and what was the result of kind of that conflict. And that result is we'll also be looking at uh, the intensity of the conflict. Was it just two boats kind of like interacting with each other, and then they went their separate ways? That can be a very low intensity conflict or it could be very intense where boats are ramming into one another. Then taking the, the fisheries data, the economic data, the conflict database is where we're hoping to come up with uh, some conflict cooperation theory. Um, so current thinking right now is that resource scarcity will drive fisheries conflict, uh, but we also know that abundance right, can drive conflict. Uh, and again, just tying back to these questions of who does and who doesn't have access to the resource and where that access has historically been and where we're expecting it to be in the future. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to kind of some micro scale impacts, which are not as directly tied to these ideas of, uh, of conflict at that geopolitical level, but it's still important because there are people, not just nations who live on these islands, who are also gonna be affected by the same phenomena of climate change and shifting fisheries, right? So we're gonna take a look at the Pacific Island food economy. And the food economy in the Pacific Islands is kind of heartbreaking, right? Uh, it's dominated by imports. Um, imports now exceed exports. Typically what's being imported are starches in the form of uh, white rice, right? Um, and also tons and tons of processed meat. Uh, Spam was my favorite thing growing up. I still enjoy the occasional spam. I don't eat that much meat, but you put a nice spam musubi in front of me. <laughs> Good times. Um, 
And, and so what we're seeing is not the healthy stuff is coming into these places. Um, what's even kind of more interesting is that there's little regional exchange, right? There's not goods from, say, uh, one of the islands going over to the other islands much. It's almost all of the exports are going outside of the region. Um, again, as we um, mentioned earlier, uh, the tuna fishery in the region contributes about 25% of global catch, right? So um, if you think about it this way, like we all like we all hear the wonders of omega-3s, right? Super good for the brain, gotta get it, like lean fat, super awesome for you. And so uh, the Pacific Islands are providing the world with one in four of its really, really good quality protein. In return, <laughs> we're getting spam, corned beef, and white rice. All right, so there's there's um, an interesting, you, you could choose some interesting language to describe the Pacific Island food economy. Uh, unjust might be one, uh, exploitative, extractive, um, I'm sure there's more we can think of. Uh, but in short, there's lots of high quality protein and fruit leaving the region in exchange for low quality food. Right, And this has an impact on not just the food economy, but nutritional economy. Here. And so this is looking, this is a study looking at early childhood diets from the US affiliated uh, Pacific Islands and Alaska. They tend to lump a lot, USDA tends to lump Alaska in uh, with the Pacific Islands often. And what we're looking at here is they've divided the, uh, the US affiliated Pacific Islands into different levels of income, so economic development. And on the high end side, we have places like Hawaii, Guam, and the CNMI, where I grew up. Then on the lower end side, we have uh, places like Kofrai, Ponte, and Yap. And what's interesting here is if we're looking at this ranking of, um, of food, is that for the low middle income jurisdictions, they actually eat a bit of fresh fish. It's pretty high on, on the early childhood diets. But you go over to these high income jurisdictions and fresh fish isn't even the top five, right? So there's there's this really um, fascinating combination of things going on. There's this abundance of fish that's leaving. The US actually has access to a lot of the fish there, but the people aren't getting any access to that. So that, that's just something I think we should all pause and really think about in terms of justice. All right, we'll, we'll zoom in a bit more on that. Is in the CNMI, it's chicken, eggs, sausage, pork, and then lunch and meats. I'm surprised lunch and meats is number five. Um, and another interesting thing from this study that I didn't put in here is when it comes to fruits and vegetables, uh, this is just an interesting way that the study is designed, but the number one uh, source of uh, vegetable product is soy sauce in a lot of these places because it is derived from the soy plant. So technically they're calling it a, um, a, a vegetable. And so, you know, if you say like, well, where's your, meat coming from and where's your vegetables from? No, very starch dire situations we're seeing here. So right, we have this food and nutritional conundrum for the high income US Pacific Islands. Is, well, we have to ask the question, why are they so different from their neighbors and how will climate change exacerbate these trends, right? And so this is a, a modeled um, study of fisheries catch potential, how likely you are to get fish out of uh, the ocean under some different climate change scenarios. And you know, under the worst case scenario, we're seeing huge, huge, huge 100% uh, uh, decreases in um, catch potential. Uh, but even in moderate uh, and near-term uh, scenarios, we're seeing that there is going to be some change there. So the access to maybe some of the best local, locally derived food sources is, um, is changing, it's decreasing. But then to kind of throw a whole nother wrench into this food um, security and nutritional security um, conundrum is the role that conservation is playing, right? We often think of conservation as being a way to restore, a way to uh, keep uh, the environment and communities healthy. But oftentimes we don't consider the issue of access, right? And a lot of our conservation decisions are around access. Maybe not whether you can go in or out, but what can you do or what can't you do once you're in and out? So a study we recently completed was kind of looking at uh, the level of protection um, around the different islands in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas and looking at uh, what are the, you know, 
what are the blue food resources most susceptible to climate change, uh, given that this is the landscape of access, right? We have some pretty large protected areas um, around there that limit fishing. Um, and so what are the laws and regulations surrounding blue food? So what's our fisheries management protocol here? How does that intersect with conservation? Um, there's tons of military exclusion zones around some of these islands where you can't fish, but you can drop bombs. Um, so an interesting use of uh, land. We also have some economic tools in play um, that are happening here, like the Jones Act, right? So that dictates maritime shipping, where and how vessels get from one U.S. port to another might make sense uh, in a place like California or Florida, where your ports might be quite close to one another, but in places where you have to sail for days to get from Hawaii to Guam, maybe the Jones Act is actually um, making things a little bit more difficult. And so we want to understand what are some local perceptions of climate and blue food security, and what does that blue foods economy look like? All right, so we're tying all that together to talk about the American dream. <laughs> uh, and it's that Pacific Islands are really, really important for America. In fact, they're at the forefront of American military spending. Uh, this was another uh, story in the New York Times Magazine from just a couple months ago, but outlined uh, America's investment in its islands um, today. And the US is investing $4 billion in Guam, but not to feed its people, not to correct um, the food insecurity issues, but to build a missile defense system, to uh, dredge the port so that bigger aircraft carriers and submarines can get in there. Um, they're currently trying to spend $121 million in Palau to build a new airstrip for fighter jets to land on. They're investing $432 million in the federal states of Micronesia to expand uh, weapons testing training programs nearly $400 million uh, in my home islands, also to do uh, more live fire training in the islands. Um, and so these islands are at the forefront of fisheries changes, at the forefront of military spending, and also in very, very vulnerable social and economic situations, right? And I think this, uh, this title, uh, when I saw it instantly in tears, the America that Americans forget, right? Um, the tensions with China mount, the US military continues to build up Guam, and other territories, placing the burdens of imperial power on the nation's most ignored and underrepresented citizens, right? But, but there is a different reality, right? That's an American dream, but there's a different reality and that Pacific Islanders are generational stewards of land and sea, right? They're explorers, they take risks, they're ready to experiment, right? They're not relics of the past, they're 21st century uh, citizens and communities. And they're global citizens fighting for climate, environmental, and social justice. Not because it's a niche idea, but because it's life or death for, for a lot of them. It's these different um, avenues. So we're going to come back around and close with this quote by Apeli Haolfa again. There's no people on Earth are more situated to be guardians of the world's largest ocean than those for whom it has been home for decades. 